We are live. All right. All right. Well, welcome back from after Thanksgiving, right? Everybody had a great Thanksgiving, I guess. Um, so uh, loaded up on turkey and all that stuff. Got some naps in. So now we're ready to uh, start this section. We're on chapter 12 from Grudem's book. Uh, the title is Man as Male and Female. And uh, does anybody remember where this scripture reference comes from in terms of God describing, creating man and then describing him as male and female? Anybody remember? Genesis. Genesis what? Three. Genesis 5, 1 and 2. Genesis 3 is the fall chapter. That's where man goes south. Okay. Uh, let's, let's turn to Genesis chapter 5. And let's look at verses 1 and 2. So we can kind of have it in our mind where we're going. Then I want to talk about a little bit of this over here. And then we'll jump right in and start looking at our outline here uh, tonight. So... Um, <clears throat> Chapter 5, Moses is writing about the descendants of Adam. This is where he talks about the next generations and the next generations. Uh, where you get uh, Methuselah and all those guys like living 900 years and all that kind of thing. But really we want to look at these first two verses in Genesis 5. And it says this. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man... Okay, there's that generic term man. He made him in the likeness of God. Verse 2. He created them in reference to man. How? Male and female. Male and female. All right. And he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. So... Where does this moniker come from right here? Adam. Nope. Where? God. God names them. It says God named them. Man. And then out of that, he separated them into male and female. So really, in a kind of a roundabout way, we kind of put this on the front, human, is all of us, okay, that um, we understand as being human, and then out of the human race, there is pink ones and blue ones, male and female, right, okay, there isn't, uh, as much as culture, and as much as Hollywood, much as the progressives, and all the people want to do, they want to make it male and female, and it is and whatever else, okay? However that's done, I do not know. But the last I checked, it's just a pink one and a blue one. That's, that's God's design, okay? So we've got to remember, not only does God name them, God designed them. Okay? We need to keep those two uh, central tenets, so to speak, uh, in focus as we deal with this subject, especially because this is where we get our authority to deal with this subject. We have to go back to what God says about this. And where does God speak? What do we have in front of us that this is how God speaks? The Scripture. So we have to look at the Scripture. Now, this brings us to... This right here, what I want to what I want to talk about right here. All right. Today, um, well, let's talk about this for a second. What is uh, feminism? What is that? We have one, two, three, four, five, six females in here. Can you tell me, females, what is feminism? Holly, you probably got a good idea of being teaching well, sociology. What what do, what do you use? I mean, the way the way that I teach it is it's a framework to look for in sociology as far as explaining why people behave the way they do. But typically, in the feminist thought, 
Um, there's a lot of focus on inequality uh, between men and women, especially focusing on uh, disadvantages of being a female within society. Okay, and then, and then in a way that we were trying to rectify that to yeah. bring about a uh, co-equality, so to speak, right. or there would be some on the ultra radical. radical feminism, like we got to squash everything as male yep. and, you know, uh, basically reverse the roles, right? Yeah, so th there's like three different kind of dimensions. You have radical, social, and liberal feminism. Okay. And so, yeah, they all have different ideas. Social would be more of that equality. And then you'd have the radical that would be more extreme of almost eliminating one particular gender. Sure, yeah, well, let's just, you know, we don't need males. That, that would be the Wonder Woman, Amazonian, well, let's live on the island, and no males at all, right? We don't need, you know. Yeah, they're, they're the reason we have all the problems. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They're, they're thought processes. Right, pro yeah, exactly. Okay, so, um, is that healthy? No, no. Okay, why is it not healthy? Females are the only ones that can have babies, as far as I know. Okay. So we need men to do that. Sure. Right. Well, I mean, today you don't. The, the radicals are trying to eliminate that. Right. Right. Well, like, we've got test tube babies, right? Artificial insemination, yeah. those kind of things, right? Okay. So, I mean, science has caught up to our ideology where we like, man, I don't, let's go to a sperm bank, right? But you still have to have a male, right? Mm -hmm. What if you wiped out all of the males? And there wasn't a sperm bank. What would happen to generations? Yeah, you would have one generation and that would be it. There's a reason God's created um, male and female to procreate. So get busy and fill it up, is what he said, basically, in my translation. Um, you know, my Hebrew translation. You look at it, he said, go and procreate. Okay, go and fill up the earth. Um, make, you know, giraffes make giraffes, you know. Monkeys make monkeys, you know, insects, they have insects. Birds have birds, right? And humans have what? Monkeys. Yeah, monkeys, yeah. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Each in its order, each in its kind, species, the speciation that God has created there, okay? But look at, look at even the animal kingdom, right? Uh, you have a lion and a what? Lioness, okay, a male and a female, right? Um, you have a, in chicken kind, you have a rooster and a what? Yeah. And a hen, okay? You got to have the two there to, to make it work, okay? Um, so, you know, the, the, the age-old question, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Chicken. The chicken did, right? How do we know that? Because he created them. Yeah, exactly. It, we go back to what God has done, right? I mean, it's the old conundrum of, you know, let's bat this around and figure out what, what. But we answer from a biblical point of view. God created its kind. And then after that, they procreated. And the egg is part of that procreation process. It's just the, simply the next generation. If it's a fertilized egg, if it's not, then it's my breakfast, right? Okay. You know. But as we look at this whole idea, we need to keep in mind our feelings versus biblical fact. So many times we come to this subject with our feelings hanging all over our sleeve and we get passionate about it and we get up in arms about it and we start screaming at people and we don't stop long enough especially as Christians, to look at the biblical facts. Then we need to come to this idea of culture versus Scripture. Because so many times we can get caught up in feelings and what does our culture say, which then drives us to make a determination about male and female and their roles, whether they're egalitarian or complementarian, what is the role in the church as opposed to secular society. So you really got to take all that into consideration because within the church and society, or what we would call culture, would you say there are distinct roles that men and women have? 
Okay? And again, remember, we're going to look at biblical fact. Now, in society, feminism, sociology, all those kind of things would call both male and female equal in what? In what society would say? In what, what does society say? Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Right. Rights? Yeah. Basically everything, right? Ideally. Okay. Can you have a female president? Sure. sure. Why not? Yeah, absolutely you can. It, it has to be the right one. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's the key, the right one, right? Um, can you have a uh, female president or CEO of a multi-billion dollar company? Absolutely. There's some great women leaders out there. Absolutely. But when it comes to leadership in the church, where do we stand? In room. Okay. I was curious about that because, you know, it's like I've known that there's some churches where you do see women yes. as being in higher level positions, but... I, I mean, I don't know. The Baptist, what, what is their thought? Because I did see both of those um, sides of it, and I didn't know, honestly. Where we stand on things? Yeah. yeah. Um, when, it, when it comes to, uh, again, as, as, as this Baptist church, mm -hmm. okay? Now, there, there's lots of different Baptist churches. You know, you look at the Baptist denomination, it's like a bunch of tree roots. There's so many of them, yeah. all right? But... Our particular church within our denomination tends to lean really, really right when it comes to God's authority, mm -hmm. the interpretation of Scripture, and then leadership within the church. Mm -hmm. All right? So it would be primarily male leadership. Mm -hmm. You would have no female senior pastors, no female elders, but we do have female deacons. We call them deaconesses yes. and deacons. All right. So really, um, really what you would say is that in the church, uh, we have this, this term in culture, in society, that uh, we use, okay, glass ceiling. What does that mean? A certain level you get to, and then it stops. And, and, and primarily it's for who? Women, all right? So there's this glass ceiling, which this really isn't a glass ceiling because it's a black mark, but uh, it, it's transparent that they get only to this point here, and then it you can't get above that, all right? And in a, in a sense, it's kind of a, um, we don't want to use this term, but it really is. It's a, it's a sense of discrimination against women that... Well, you don't have the right acumen to lead a multi-billion dollar company. You don't have the, uh, shall we say, the drive, you know, to, to, you know, be cutthroat and go out there and just bowl, you know, people over and just rip through another company and buy it, dismantle it, put people out of work so we can have profits, all that kind of things where they, they probably play upon the, the, the ladies and women's uh, more compassionate motherly side. Whereas guys are more hunters, destroyers, warriors. And so that mentality gets brought to businesses. And then women have this like, I can't get past that to get to be the you know, CEO, etc. of companies. But this is slowly going away. Okay. Um, because there are some very powerful lady CEOs of great companies that are out there, okay? But this is a reality still. This is a reality still. But here's the thing. There is a glass ceiling in the church. Is it glass? Or is, is it, it really glass ceiling? or more of like a... Because when you, when you think of glass, I mean, you think of... You know, being able to see next, and there's just something you can't wear is here. There's Correct. Like, right. Well, you can't do it anyway. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I would, I would uh, not use that term for the church. The wood ceiling. Yeah, the wood like ceiling. That. There, there is a, there's a ceiling, so to speak, of authority yeah. that God has designed. 
All right. So meaning that like when we come to elders, pastors, and then what we're talking about here is teaching doctrine, passing that on, there is a ceiling that that in conservative, right-leaning, biblical churches that this is a role primarily, uh, exclusively uh, reserved for men. Okay. Now, why the difference here? Why the difference? I think the church recognizes that men and women <laughs> are not the same persons. They have unique characteristics or okay. provide certain qualities that they can share in their strength. Okay. Complementary. Yeah. All right. Well, it goes back to being biblical. Okay, it goes back to being biblical. The roles. <laughs> Okay, and we're going we're gonna to discover this a little bit deeper here in section C of your outline where we're going to look at the roles and why they're that way, okay, and how, how we're looking at that. Now, um, if you've looked through your chapter, you'll understand that God's created male and female to be in personal relationship. We are not an island in and of ourselves, all right? As much as we want to try to, you know, you know, be the isolationist and go out and just live by ourselves and on our own, you're, you're, going, you're going to go nuts, okay? Uh, you need people. You need interaction, all right? As sometimes as good as it is and as bad as it is, you still need that interaction because it's like iron sharpening iron. It chips off those things to make us better. Um, and that's what is so tragic about the, um, the debates going on in culture right now because everybody wants to shut down any opposing thought or disagreement to their idea and not have a healthy debate about something to learn and grow and expand and see where the other person is and all that. They don't want to have that. They want to have their own little debating safe space, what we call an echo chamber, and they just talk and they all agree, oh yeah, that's a great idea. That's a good... And they never get outside of that to realize that there is a much more robust understanding of the world. And the same thing with this, uh, this idea here. We need to understand this because some will come in and just want to wreak havoc on the church and say, well, you guys are so out of step as a church. You need to get with culture and you need to get with your feelings and you need to get with it. And catch up with the times. And do away with that old Victorian uh, way of thinking. And why not let you know women be senior pastors? And why not let them be uh, on the elder board? And why not you know, let them do whatever? And so the church then is automatically set up as a kind of a, as a nemesis to society, culture, feelings, feminism, progressive thought, all that kind of stuff is set up against the church itself. And so we had to fight through all of that. But again, what we have to do is come back and say, okay, who named them and who designed them? And that's where our authority lies. And so we've got to look at this from a biblical point of view and hold to our guns. Because once we allow the ship to start leaking, it doesn't take long, right? If you're out on the ocean and you've got a leak in your boat, it's not a good thing. I don't care how small the leak is. It's still a leak, and you're taking on water. And so once you open that door or open that crack where you start to have the leakage come in, it's never a good thing. So we've got to hold to our idea of where do we get our authority on this? Okay, where does it come from? Now, when you name something, what does that mean for you? You own it. Right? So you go to the dog pound and you get an it. Okay? A nice fluffy it. And they have to make it an it. Right? Neuter it, spay it, whatever they're going to do to it. And then you bring it home. And whatever sign was on Fluffy's cage, when you saw it at the, you know, whatever, you bring it home and you make it your own. And you name that animal whether it's a cat or a dog or a chinchilla or a snail or whatever, you're, whatever you have as a pet, you're naming it, OK? 
Okay, so Jasmine, oh, I remember Jasmine. Any other dog? No. Okay, got Jasmine. Do you have a pet? What's your pet's name? Lexi and Rosie. Lexi and Rosie. See, you named your pets. Do you have a pet? No, sir. No pets? Yeah, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a pet? Do you have a pet? Okay, how about you guys? Oh, yeah, you got uh, two Cocker Spaniels. Cocker Spaniels, yes. Okay, very good. So you've named them. How about you guys? Yeah. What do you have? Three dogs. What are the names? Skeeter, Hickey, and Addie. Skeeter, Hickey, and Addie. All right, how about you? I got a zoo. I got four dogs and two cats. Okay, four dogs and two cats. All right. I've got four pets. Uh, I've got a dog named Chip. I've got three cats. They're really all my daughter's cats. We have Socks, which is our oldest cat. She's been around with us the longest. Uh, she's got little white boots on her feet, all four of them. That's why we call her Socks. We have Puma. She's our smallest cat, and she's Andre as day is long. And then we have Finny, which I also call Skippy, because he's our tripod cat. He only has three legs. Oh, yeah. The other one got shot out from under, and we had to have it amputated. So, um, And so we named our pets which means that we own them. They, they are part of us. So look what God does to the human race. He names them male and female. So in the naming of it, there is relationship. Okay. Now, think about this in terms of marriage. Now, I get it. There's some ladies that want to keep a hyphenated name or they don't want to give up their name because of you know, whatever it is, their career or whatever. But typically when people get married, what takes place in the marriage in terms of names? The wife takes the name of the husband. Now, why? Why isn't the husband takes the name of the wife? Has anybody ever asked that question? Oh, they, there are people that do. Okay. <laughs> but... It's, uh, it's because you belong to them. I mean, in a sense. Okay. You're joined together as one. Okay. And, but but if somebody would say, well, you're joined together as one and we're equal. So why not, like, guy take my... And I've known guys who've taken the ladies' names. It's, it's kind of strange. Yeah. It's not the norm, so to speak, okay? But is there, is there an, a really an ideal or why it, it's done normally with... Females taking the male's name, is there any? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, you could go back to biblical, but obviously, like, in earlier societies, males held property, and uh, they tended to be the leader, okay. and so the woman would leave her parents' house and join him in his house, and so it was almost kind of like an ownership, you know, and, and he had access to those resources that she didn't, so it made sense that okay. she would take the Okay, there's a very patriarchal type of yeah. structure. And then, I mean, you look in, you look in the Bible and God says, uh, man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. So there's a relationship that is being bonded there. And then, like you were saying, Jewish custom was that a male would go get a wife, a female, and bring her back to her the, the father's house and build on to dad's house. And then what you're doing is incorporating and bringing that in. And then the whole idea of the dowry comes in. Mm -hmm. What is the concept of dowry? Payment, Payment for what? For the, daughter. for the daughter, right? Because the you're you're losing something out of your family, right? And then you're paying for that. It's not like you were going out, hey, I'm going to find the greatest woman I can and I'm going to buy her. You know, that's not what we're doing. And that's not the whole idea. There was a loss in the family. And so the dowry was to help compensate the marriage unity that was taking place. Okay. All right. Because now the daughter is being taken under the wing of the husband and the father's home, which he's attached to. So the father of that family, if he has a bunch of boys, man, he's gaining more and more and more, more grandkids. Whereas the poor sap over here that only has girls, they're all leaving. And nothing. And so it is a way to compensate that father for his loss. Okay? That's the whole idea there behind the dowry. So not only does culture very well play into this in terms of defining uh, scripture for us too as well, when we're leaving and cleaving and all that, but there's also tradition, 
that goes along with it as well. But the biggest thing that we need to look at here is the authority and what we call headship. And these have to deal with the roles that male and females play within the structure of the church itself. All right. So let's really jump in here and dive in for this last 30 minutes on the differences of roles between men and women here. All right. Now, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is this word right here. That has screwed this whole thing up royally. All right. Screwed it up royally. Now, would you say in Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, that there were roles that the male and the female had? Yes. Yes. Okay. Tell me, what, what were those roles? Eve was a helper. Eve was a helper. All right. That evil word, helper. Okay. Helper implies what? Does it imply like partner or almost like a kind of egalitarian, like complementary role? Whereas we tend to look at that and go, oh, that's so subservient. That yeah, it's subservient, not. right? Yeah, that's what we tend to think. But, but would, you, would you say that, uh, hey, uh, you know, my car broke down. Can you come over and help me put my new alternator in? And now all of a sudden, David Wells comes over and he's like my master. Yo, pastor, go over and get that wrench for me or go do this or whatever. I mean, is that how it works? Is that what a helper is? It's assistant. Okay. So people tend to throw more and more baggage on top of this whole idea of helper. But it implies that there's someone that needs what? Help. Okay. So you got Adam and Eve comes along. To be his helpmate. Help him out. What is it? What was Adam's job? He had one job. What? Yeah, tend the garden. Alright, now I don't know what that meant. I don't know. He's out there on his, you know, John Deere tractor out in the back 40 running, you know, I, I don't know, picking fruit. Naming things. Naming things. Yeah, he gets to name everything, right? What what does it mean to tend the garden? We you know, I, I always kind of looked at it as kind of like overseeing the garden, you know, like you tend it, you know, you take care of it, but yeah. you kind of oversee it. Okay. So when God says tend the garden, there's an oversight, mm -hmm. which means that now we have what? Authority, Authority over it, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Eve comes along and is going to be his helper. All right. So there are certain roles within that, but then all of a sudden, sin comes along and messes this whole thing up. And I mean, it is so insidious and so um, so uh, destroying of relationship to the point that Adam himself would throw his wife under the bus and God to get out of the clear. In Genesis 3. Okay? Now, let's look at the breakdown of this whole thing in the family. Turn to Genesis 3 with me real quick. And let's look down at... Let's start with verse 8. Okay? I'm going to tie my shoe here before I trip on myself. You need to help me. I need help. Yeah, my wife's not here. All right, Genesis 3. Let's start with verse 8, and we'll read down to um, let's read down to verse 12. And I want you to notice how sin is quick acting here and how fast things go south. All right. They, meaning Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. All right, so what has now gone south so quickly? Yeah, open fellowship, right? Because now all of a sudden fear 
Okay. Have you, remember back in the day when you did something wrong and your parents come marching in the room and all of a sudden it's like, man, I'm jumping behind the couch, right? Trying to hide because it's like, man, I'm going to get in trouble here. This is what's going on. All right. So instead of jumping behind the couch, they jump behind the trees, into the bushes. All right. And then verse nine, God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Now, God being all knowing... Does he ask this question? To, he knows, he knows. Is he asking him like he, he lost Adam? His GPS just kind of went out? No. What is he doing here? What is God doing? Find out what Adam is say. Yeah, he wants him to own up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like, okay, where are you? Knowing that, you know, you see the, you, you run quickly and you get behind the curtains and, you know, you're standing there and you're trying to like, you're, and, and your mom and dad come in and what are they looking at? Your shoes. Your shoes, right? They know where you're at. And they're going, hey, where are you? And it's like, here I am. And that's the whole idea here. God is wanting him to pull the curtain back. And Adam, you own up to what's going on here. What happened here? I noticed he called to man, not both. Yeah. He didn't call the woman. He didn't say, Eve, where are you? He asked Adam, where are you? Dude, here and it comes back to here. You're going to own this. Okay? you got to own this. So Adam is always first addressed. Isn't that interesting? Ladies, you get, a, you get a pass right now. Okay, not right now, but not later. But now you get a pass. Man, where are you? And he said, Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And God said to him, who told you that you were naked? And then he follows it up with the next question. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, who's he addressing? Adam only. Then he said, the man said, what? <laughs> the woman. Woof, okay. And oh, by the way, God, I'm throwing you under the bus too. So he says, the woman whom you gave to me. Yeah, if you wouldn't have given it to me, I wouldn't be in this situation. Isn't that crazy? That's what it, it, that's what it implies there. Okay. Oh, we all do. It's, it's, it's that's what sin does. It clouds our judgment and makes us blame other people. We play this blame game, right? So notice how the relationship goes quickly south. The relationship between man and God has gone south. Now, all of a sudden, if Eve didn't have anything to be mad about Adam now, now this is the time to jump in here, ladies. This is the time you want to just grab a, grab a switch and beat him around the ears with it, right? Because you're throwing me under the bus. So, uh, the woman whom you gave me, she gave to me, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is it you have done? So he addresses the woman now after he deals with man, but he is... Asked him several questions to get drilled down to figure out what's going on. Did God know what was going to happen? Yes. Absolutely, he did. Absolutely. That's why Jesus, before the foundation of the world, is called the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. They knew in the Trinity that when they created man, they were going to fall, and one person of the Trinity was going to have to come down here and die for the sins of man. And Jesus said, let it be me. I'll do it. The second person of the Trinity. Aren't you glad he decided that he wanted to do that before we even created us? So we see that sin really causes a breach in the relationship between Adam and Eve and God himself here. Okay? There's, this relationship goes south pretty quick as well. Okay? And all involved, we've got problems. And now this relationship between these two really start to struggle here. Because I want to show you something here. Um, let's look at Genesis uh, 3.16. Okay, now this is between Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.16 and then 18 to 19. All right, just cross over there to a little bit. And he's going down the line 
And he's <coughs> handing down the punishment. Okay, to Adam, um, cursed are you more than... Uh, oh, he, he starts with... He, he deals with... In this interest, okay, here's how it works. He deals with Adam, deals with Eve, and then he deals with the serpent. And then he goes back up. He deals with the serpent when he uh, <coughs> mets out the punishment. Then he comes up to Eve, and then he gets to Adam. So he's wanting to find out what's going on. Then he hands out punishment as it goes back the other way. Now, look what he does. Because you have done this, cursed are you, the snake, serpent, more than all the cattle, and on your belly you'll go, eating dust uh, all the rest of your life. Now I'll put enmity between you and the woman, her seed and your seed. He'll crush your head. You'll bruise him on the, on the heel. Then he said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Which meant, she hasn't had any kids yet. So when he says greatly multiply, what does that imply that was going to be before to have kids? No pain. Probably no pain or, or just a minimal amount of pain. But God said, now, man, it, you're going you're to get the full experience. Okay, here it comes. Wham. All right. And so then uh, he gets uh, the, the childbirth and in pain you will bring forth children. Uh, yet, notice he says the word yet there, your desire, okay, Okay, the word desire there, he says, your desire will be for your husband, and he will what? Rule. Rule over you. So now, all of a sudden, it is this conflictual relationship that takes place here. All right, whereas it was going to be even, now all of a sudden, it's like, we're, we're really in a bad fix here. Okay? Now, um, the, um, in the Greek New Testament, there's a word called hupotasso that means to submit. Now, that word is a military term. That you have a commander and you're to get in line underneath that commander in a military fashion. So fall out. Lieutenants, sergeants, privates, you know, third class, second class, first class, and then dummies. Right? Get them all in line. All under one authority. That's what this word hupotasso means. And you have in the New Testament the idea that women are to submit to their husbands in the Lord. Now... This desire here is a sinful desire. This word desire here from the Hebrew means that the woman wants to usurp the authority of the man and rule over him. But God says, your desire will be for your husband, but guess what? He's going to rule over you. And there's going to be this back and forth fighting down through the ages as you live out your existence as human beings. There is always going to be the idea of women wanting to usurp male headship, okay? And that, that's just the desire that's there because of sin, okay? Now, Christ comes along, and he's going to rectify this and draw this back to the authority and what true biblical headship is all about. Now, I want you to look at... Uh, let's let's look at the distinct roles that male and females have, and then let's talk about these. All right. Who was created first? Adam. Adam was. Get rid of glass ceiling here. Okay, roles. Adam was first. Okay. Does that carry any weight? Okay, um, you, have you guys heard of what birthrights are? What is a birthright? Firstborn. Firstborn gets what? Everything. It gets everything. First male. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because yeah. again, we're patriarchal. All right. 
Uh, so there is privilege being the first. How many of you are first born in here? One, two, three of you. Okay. I, I was a second child. My, my oldest sister, she died when she was two, no, three uh, of leukemia. And I was the only male in my family. So I had an older sister who died at three when I was, I was about a year and a half old. Then my younger sister below me is four years younger than I am. Um, so I'm the middle child. So where do you land? Um, second. You're a middle. You're, I'm yep. older sister. Okay. You're just two of you, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, okay. You're firstborn. How about you? Eighth. You're eighth in the line of how many? Eight. You're eight of eight, okay? <laughs> you're firstborn. I'm the baby. You're the baby of how many? Two. Second out of four. Two of four? Baby number five. Okay. You're firstborn? I'm firstborn. Out of two. Out of two. Two of four. Okay, two of four? Thirteen. Thirteen. You're, you're thirteenth of how, how many? Thirteen. There was eleven girls and one boy. Okay. And I'm in the... So you were thirteen of thirteen. How about you? Uh, two of three. Two of three. Okay, so you're a middle child too. Okay, so I'm, I've got sisters before me. Okay. I've got like ten sisters. My mom had thirteen girls right. and one boy. Okay. So figure out. <laughs> Dorothy's the baby. So are you thirteen out of fourteen? Oh, or? I don't know. I don't know. I know that I'm one of the 13 kids. <laughs> okay. Well, you had, if you had a boy, there's 14, right? Mm -hmm. 13 girls and one boy is 14. Mm -hmm. So. Dorothy's the baby. Okay. So you were, then you're not, thir you're not, you're not uh, 13 out of 14. So somewhere in there, mm -hmm. okay, but you had 14 I'm the siblings. Oldest of or the 13. Girls. Okay. I'm the oldest of the coach girls. Okay. So there is, a, there is an idea of birthright privilege with that uh, and then when it comes to patriarchal society it's always about the firstborn male all right and uh what they get in terms of the birthright and those kind of things now remember the uh, story of the prodigal son you remember that story okay uh the son comes to his father and says give me what's mine well that normally doesn't happen to the child until what takes place? Death. Dad dies. Yeah. So really, in a sense, translated, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my stuff now. And then he runs off and squanders it, and you know the rest of the story. Um, you know the rest of the story of him coming back groveling and, and being restored and those kind of things. All right? Really beautiful story of God's forgiveness. Okay, But there's an idea of, of birthright that comes with being in a family. Okay, Adam was born first, created first, then Eve, and then the rest of the human race. So the headship falls with him, and what we would call this is federal headship. Meaning that Adam represents all of us as the human race. So as Adam goes, so we go. Meaning that you cannot say, well, it's not fair that I live in a sinful state because Adam is the one that fell and not me. Well, he represents all of humanity. But then, equally, you could flip that on its head and say, when Christ comes as the second Adam and represents humankind in salvation, and all those who would believe in him get saved, and you're saying, well... His salvation doesn't apply to me because I want to do it on my own. Well, it doesn't work that way. You cannot be saved on your own. You have to have somebody else do that for you, Christ. So you can't have one without the other. So Adam has to represent the human race, and we all fell in Adam, but we're all redeemed in Christ. Okay, That's what Paul wrote about Jesus becoming the second Adam for us. All right, uh, Perfect man that God desired for us. So Adam has uh, what we call a birthright. Um, Eve was created to be a helper. Okay, so that means that the helper has somebody that they're helping, a main person that has all that's going on. Notice in Genesis 2, 23, that Adam named Eve. Okay, he names her. Now we go back to this whole idea. When God named them, he, he was owning them over relationship. When you name something, you have authority over it. You don't necessarily, 
like own it. Like, you know, you don't go out and name some kid and then, you know, that they're their slave. You know, hey, get over here. You know, it. So when you have kids, you name them, right? You do not let the doctors at, at the hospital name your kid, right? You know, you know, what name would they want to come up with Zoe, you know? Who knows? Rebecca? You know? Who knows? You know? But it did happen to one of my friends. Get this. He's, um, his name was uh, Jeffrey Riley. And his mom, in kind of a, a, as he was born, she already knew she was going to name him Jeff, Jeffrey. And, uh, but she was so excited that the baby was here. She goes, oh, my little Jeffy. Well, the doctor hears Jeffy. And it, that was the day when they went right there in the room. They're typing up the birth certificate. Oh, you're going to name him Jeffy. So that's what's on his birth certificate, Jeffy Riley. He had to actually go to court, pay uh, the court and a judge in his, I think he's in his 60s or 70s, to get his name changed to what his mom originally wanted him to be named. Not Jeffy. Little Jeffy. Okay, that was, his, uh, that was one that was on his birth certificate for so long. And he finally decided to just go in later in life and get it changed. And it was, <laughs> it was a wild story. But... Back then, I guess that's when they just kind of typed it all up right there. So, But when we name things, we, in a sense, uh, kind of exercise authority over them. Now, remember this. God uh, created the animal kind and brought them to Adam for him to do what? Name them. Okay, so God wanted Adam to have authority over the animal kingdom. So he said, and whatever it was going to be, Adam named it. And that's what it was. Now, I don't know what language he was speaking, uh, but he named the giraffe the giraffe, and the hippo the hippo, and the dog the dog, and whatever. And so by the naming, there's authority exercised over it. So we exercise it over our pets. We exercise it over our kids. We even exercise it over in our marriage. When the woman comes under the protective headship of the husband, that's the naming process. Okay. Again, it comes under headship. And I don't want you to look at headship as, well, I'm this authority figure and I'm going to just kind of grind you into the dirt. I want you to think of this as also protection. Okay. Think of it as protection. Why do people wear wedding bands? A symbol of what? Just have rings on my finger? Unity. Symbol of uh, commitment. That's what happened between the It's an outward commitment. An outward commitment. Symbol of an outward Okay. Uh, who has wedding bands on? Hold your hand up. Okay. All right. So you're telling me that you are now off the market. Okay. And nobody can mess with you, right? So when people are, you know, they want to be kind of shady, you know, some senators or whatever, they go into a bar and they, you know, take the ring off, you know, so nobody knows that I'm, but, you know, good grief. I've had a mind on so long, there's an indentation in my finger, you know. Um, so we, we wear these for meaning, okay. Uh, we have double ring exchanges in, in marriage wear, wedding ceremonies. Where I'm taking you off the market, and you're mine, and I'm yours, and there's a mutual, uh, exclusive bond that is being created here between male and female, right? Okay, and this is a symbol of that. That people look and say, "Yeah, that guy's married. He's off the market. Whoever his wife is, whatever." Okay, um, those are there for the aspect of relationship. So there's headship. There's protection that takes place here. Uh, other roles that we see here, um, notice that God named, he didn't name him woman, he named him what? Man, and then he had male and female out of mankind, okay? Um, again, like uh, Jerry said, when God confronted Adam about the sin, he didn't confront both of them. He dialed it in on the man because of this. He said, Adam, you have headship here. Now, when it came to that tree, 
God had already instructed Adam about the garden. And he said, all of these trees are okay. Stay away from that one. And then Adam, after Eve came along, instructed her about that tree and about the rest of the fruit in the garden. So you see how the authority works there. God instructed Adam. When Eve came along, he instructed her. So there is this distinct role of headship that's taking place here. All right, stair step. Um, when it comes to the human race, uh, especially like when salvation in Adam, in Adam we all fall, in Christ we all are redeemed. Adam represents the human race, not Eve. Adam does as the headship. Okay? That comes from Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 15, and 1 Corinthians 15. Um, notice, uh, let's, let's look at when we come to the church, we have roles that are elders, pastors, deacons, and then we have deaconesses. Okay. Primarily male, male and female. Okay. Um, according to 1 Timothy 2, let's turn there because we're going to spend a little time here. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15. Now this is this is where um, those that lean into really deep feminism kind of have a problem with the church. They can't stand this verse. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15. Now, Ladies, don't bristle at this, but listen what the scriptures say here. And then let's talk about how we can um, deal with this from a biblical point of view that's not like emotions involved and kind of deal, right? All right, now listen to this. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman. She fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Wow! Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. What are you hearing from that scripture? Brooke, what are you hearing? At this point, when you were reading that, I thought to myself, because you were bad, <laughs> okay. you don't get to do this. Um, that's what I was, that's okay. why I was chuckling, because I know that's not, I mean, I mean, we all, we all have the punishment, so it doesn't, you know. Right. Okay. But my husband likes to, he always likes to bring up the submission thing. It's hilarious, especially when we're in public. Okay. Submit to me, woman. <laughs> no, this is terrible. <laughs> you, you could ask him, are we in society or are we in the church? We're in the church. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but it's funny because people will be like. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because it's a different type of submission. It's not, it's the same submit, like it's the way we submit to God. Right. You know, so it's it's a humble, it's an equal partnership. He submits right. to me in a way. Yeah, and Ephesians five twenty one tells us submit to one another. Right. But then Paul goes on to say there are certain roles sure. that we we live out as male and female. Right. Okay. So there is a mutual submission in our salvation. Uh, Galatians three. There's neither male nor female for all are one in Christ. Right. But out of that springs forth the. Uh, complementarian idea that there are roles. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the church and man, and man is the head of woman. All right. So there is distinct gradation of authority that God set up. And now, remember, I didn't write this. This is God's deal. Now, if you have a problem with it, 
come come out, you know, judgment day, then you take it up before the big guy up in heaven and say, I don't think this is supposed to be this way. And it's like, well, who are you? You know, and you, and you go back to the ideas like the clay and the pot cannot tell the potter how to make the pot. Okay? He gets to make the decisions. We don't. He makes those decisions. And it's the same is true within the family. When Ethan was little, I used to always say it goes from God to me to you. Mm -hmm. Because there's, he, he didn't have God. Right. So, so we always tried to, to, to talk about that. Sure. So that way he would understand that there's a place for him. Right. Now, when, when Rob came along, was there, uh, when your family was blended, was there any issues of the authority that took place there? On my side, because I had been the head. So yeah, sure. So I had, so there was a little bit of me having to back down from that. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it was hard because it's the simple nature. Of, sure. You know, once you're the head, you want to be the head. Correct. So, it's it's yeah. this desire, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, so there's been times where, you know. Yeah, but I have a really strong husband, so that helps. Yeah. You know? Well, he's got to be be a highway patrolman, right? That's yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. But think about this for a minute. The. Um, uh, what, what happens to uh, women in their marriage relationship when they have a wimpy, lack of authority, <laughs> headship type of husband? Maybe not even a spiritual kind of person, but they're very deeply spiritual and um, want their family to really honor the Bible, love the Lord, uh, understand authority and headship, but... The husband just didn't quite. You're just getting it. What? How? How does that work for a lady? Well, it's a prayer. Pray okay. God to make to help her husband. Okay. All right. So a lot of prayer. Yeah. And patience. Patience. Okay. I would say it might create like a sense of insecurity almost in the woman. Um, you know, I, even though you know women are strong and they can be independent, I think no matter how independent they get, it's still a comfort to be able to lean on somebody else, especially if there's a significant other. And if they're not taking up that natural leadership role within the family, I, I think it would cause a great deal of maybe fear, stress, insecurity. Okay, which this is supposed to be there the and it's not, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And I, I could tell you more times than I count on my hands of I've had counseling sessions with couples who come in and the husband is like a limp noodle when he needs to be a rod, you know, like, like an authoritative, you know, stick to beat the wolves back and all the monsters. But yet he's like, eh. But society has made man, man be. Yeah, yeah, we've emasculated man, have yeah. we not? Unfortunately, we have. Yeah. We have. Yeah. I mean, I don't watch television because I don't have cable or satellite or anything. But I want to tell you the sitcoms that are out there, they emasculate the man big time. They make the dad the stupid Oh, he's idiot. the dumbest knucklehead walking. Yeah. Stupid idiot. And the wife is running the show. He's Absolutely. Just an idiot. Yeah, married yeah. with children. I think that's probably one that's. Oh, well, that was, yeah, that was probably one of the first ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not the. Um, what was the Archie Bunker. Uh, um, what was that? Like All in the Family. All in the Family, yeah. Um, I mean. Granted, he, I mean, he had no biblical authority whatsoever. Oh, you know, the guy was a knucklehead. But he was one of those like, yeah, hey, yeah, do this, I'm, I'm the man. And, you know, uh, meathead over here, you know, or his, his son-in-law. And he always would run down Edith all the time. You know, it's just like, can we not have, like, just somebody be encouraging on this sitcom, you know? Uh, but all of a sudden now, it went from that to where the roles just totally flipped. Where now a guy can't even go to the grocery store and know what to get. Or to hold the door open for a woman without her being offended. Yeah. 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 Stupid stuff like that. Whatever I happened to male chivalry, you know? I, I, I like I love chivalry. I like that. Yeah. Uh, some women don't, you know? Um, and, and, you know, it's really on us guys to model that to our sons and also model it to our daughters. So that when we're out, uh, you know, even if it's like, hey, I take my daughter to the store, and she goes to Walmart with them, when we come out, instead of me just going and getting in the car, I walk around and I open the door for her so she can get in. Okay? Aww. It, 
set the bar high. Well, I have to. <laughs> because no, that's a good thing. And it is a good thing because I don't, I don't, I want her to have a husband that treats her that way. And if I don't model, if I just model that she's not worth anything, that's kind of the person that she's going to get. I don't care if I do that or not, but I want to model that for her so she knows that, hey, you pick a guy that honors you. Okay. But when a woman has been on her own for quite a while yeah. and not had that, you forget to let a man do that. Okay, and then that goes back to what Brooke was saying is that for so long I've been like the main, the head of the family. Yeah. I had to really kind of come to a reckoning in myself to release that. Yeah. yeah. And rethink. Yeah, and it gets hard because especially, you know, my husband's gone quite a bit. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that I do. But when you come, like, it's, I've just adjusted to it now. But being there for a while, it was a it was a hard thing because I was so independent without him. Sure. And then, you know, and then realized that that, you know, this is the design. You have to kind of always go back, like you said, to biblical facts. Yeah. And scripture, and remember that this is my place, and this is the way it's supposed to be for this to work. Sure. So it works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, it, you know, it, it's not perfect because we're sinful. Now, it's the perfect design. Yes, sir. Now, when we're recreated in our new bodies and new heaven and new earth, that's going to be all Gucci, as my daughter would say. Okay? <laughs> uh, but we're, right now, because of our sin, we have the issues of the headship and, and desire and rule over you and this conflictual relationship that goes on uh, within the relationship. And, you know, when I have um, new couples come to me and say, hey, would you do marriage counseling and all that? And I said, sure, I'd love to be able to tear you guys apart and try to build you back together because I'm going to take two sinful people and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you how sinful you really are. And then we can build up from there. So if you ever want to come to me about counseling, know that i got to tear down something before I build it back up, all right? And I'm going to ask you the hard questions, okay? And so you may not want to come and see me, okay? Uh, but I, I will ask the hard questions. I, I don't beat around the bushes. I just like, let's get to it, and let's get down to it, and here's where the issues are. Unless this fluffy stuff floating around on the surface, we're going deep, all right? Okay. Would you expound on uh, verse 15? Verse 15. Um, in, that, in that chapter. Oh, in, in 1 Timothy 2.15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. The That's one of the most confusing verses Um that, that's really that's out there and how what was Paul trying to get across in this verse here um, some look at this as like well if you have kids then the generations of preservation are there now but then it begs the question what about the female who can't have kids yeah. okay which then begs that question so I don't think it's because just that you're fertile and have the next generation of kids that something happens there I think it's through the family itself and the authority and the structure that, that is, because remember, context is king, so you have to keep it in its context, all right? And the gradation of headship and authority is there, all right? And so he may be, now I, I don't know totally, he may be speaking of that fact of the authority of the headship that's there in terms of the preservation, okay? Um, the other thing here is, notice it says, will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith, love, and sanctity with self-restraint. That talks more about um, individual restraint to not want to usurp the husband's authority. Okay? So it's not, I don't think the, see what we do is we look at it and we say focus is on bearing children, but I don't think that's the focus here. I think it's the other part at the end of it where it says, um, continuing in faith, love, and sanctity with self-restraint. Now, what is what is faith? Now, the faith he's speaking of, what is it? Now, when we say the faith, what do we say? Well, belief is something you can't see. Okay. So, in this case, would it be Jesus? I mean, yeah, our, our salvation, salvation, right? Yeah, so the faith, meaning 
the faith of the whole entity. Okay, not our individual faith, but the faith. Of the, don't go outside of that. All right? So stay under the umbrella of the headship of the church. Okay? The man in the church. So stay underneath that. The other is in love. What is love? Can you define for me love? I love pizza and I love my wife. Is it the same thing? No. It better not be. Okay, it better not be. I love my car or I love racing motorcycles or cars or whatever it is. And I love my wife. Well, love's like a decision. Okay. I mean, a decision to commit. Yeah, it is an action. It's an action. It, it, you're, you're exactly right. It is an action. Show me how you love me. Mm -hmm. Okay? You can say it all day long. You know, you get up in the morning, you hug your wife and have coffee. Hey, I love you, honey. Well, show me that you love me. Wash your dad gum dishes. Mm -hmm. Pick up your underwear off the floor. Stop throwing your towel on the floor after your shower. <laughs> okay? Pick it up and hang it up. All right? Iron your wife's clothes every now and then. Okay. <laughs> Stay away from my clothes, right? I do. Listen, I do iron my wife's scrubs in the morning. Aww, that's nice. I just that I I don't want people going out of my house looking like they've slept in the dresser all night long, you know. So I iron her scrubs for her. I'll even iron my kids, you know, t-shirts if they they look going out the door and look at what is dude. Get back to the back. We're going to get this ironed out here. It's crazy. I'm going to throw you in some of that. Okay. <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, she got you back for calling her your pet. Now you're, you're going to do your ironing, Iron Man. You can do a lot of things, but I don't think it's going to be iron. Yeah. You know, guys, you know how to get out of ironing? Burn something. I mean, put the print right in it and then go, here, honey, and you, you're never ironing anything from mine again, ever. Hint, I said stay away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No That's the way to do it. No laundry gets done. Okay. My brother learned that one real quick. Like, we tried to get him to do laundry because we were a single parent family. Sure. Yeah, and he, he dyed all the whites, and my mother never asked him to do laundry ever. Yeah. He's yeah. Smart. Watch this. I'm going to throw this pink underwear he in here. He did it. Yeah. I know he did it. Yeah, nice. Um, I've got a book uh, from Grudem, who's your, your author here, along with John Piper, who both are editors of the book, and then they have scholars who have written uh, on certain topics of biblical manhood and womanhood, okay? And um, if you want that book, and I can email it to you, all right? Here's what I need you to do. I need you to text me your email address, and then I will email that to you. And it is an entire book that you can read through on biblical womanhood and biblical manhood. And all these scholars come to the table with some really good research that is biblical, not cultural, not their own feelings, but what is biblical about this, okay? And some of them may, you may get sideways a little bit with it, but remember, you've got to take Scripture and biblical facts and keep them at the forefront of this subject, okay? you got to keep that, uh, you got to keep that there, okay? So if you want that book, grab my number, text me, and I will get that to you, all right? And uh, we'll go from there, okay? And I'll do that... Uh, Probably tomorrow, uh, once I once I get my feet back on the ground after after the day. Day's been a long day. I've had a funeral and all kinds of stuff going on today. So I think somebody just texted you on your phone. Oh really? Yeah, probably Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think I don't Brooke. do it now. I will forget. Okay. Yeah. Somebody on Facebook. Maybe Facebook Live from California or Alaska is texting me too. So all right. So anyway, yeah, I will get that to you and um, shoot it out to you tomorrow when I get to the office and we'll go from there, okay? Any thoughts or comments or questions about this subject before we move on? Because next week we're going to deal with, uh, I think, sin. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, dun, dun, dun. There's a reason that we don't teach, you know, sin 101, you know, in our Sunday school classes. You know, we, we just do that naturally, right? 
So what we're going to do is look at the nature of man in sin and how we overcome that in Christ. Now, we're going to have a next. We're going to have this class next next Wednesday. Uh, I believe so. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, do I have it down? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I think the the next break is uh, Christmas. the twenty seventh and the third, which is Christmas week and New Year's week. So we have uh, sin, the person of Christ, and atonement before our two week break. So we have three more classes, 12. and then a two-week break, all right? Yeah. And then we jump into the last part, and there are no breaks there. So we're going to head to the end there. All right. The seventh and the third is okay. Okay, questions, comments, anything? We're good? He didn't have a so Okay, yeah, that was right down all right, very good. Well, let me, uh, can I have, let, since we're dealing with male and female, can I have a female tonight close us in prayer? I will. All right, Dorothy, thank you very much. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how great it is to come before you. And how great it is to be able to assemble in your church to study your word. Dear Heavenly Father, let us take from this session words of wisdom and words from the highest authority, your Bible, your word, that we may try and live better lives each and every day. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that we have this privilege. And that you will always be there for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. Have a great evening. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you Sunday, I guess. We're starting our Christmas series on Sunday, so it's going to be fun. Okay.